If you have a Bible, which I hope you have, I want to read from an erotic love song right in the middle of your Bible. It's called the Song of Solomon. And I can't find it myself now. Every couple I've married, I've sent them away on their honeymoon to read this book through. It's a book of real human love. Solomon's Song of Songs. And it begins with the girl singing. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. Take me away with you, let us hurry. The king has brought me into his chambers. And her friends say, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. And she goes on, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of their vineyards, my own vineyard I have neglected. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? And at last he speaks. If you do not know most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. And she replies, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh, resting between my breasts. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Angedi. And he says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful, your eyes are doves. And she responds immediately, how handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming and our bed is verdant or green. And he says, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. And she says, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. But he says, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. And she responds, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He has taken me into the banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my lover, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My, 
my lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit, and the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. And he says, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice. You've just been singing that and it's straight from this song. Did you realize that? Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our, vine our vineyards that are in bloom. And she says, my lover is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn, my lover, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged hills. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made the rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. I'm going to stop there or my spectacles will steam up. <laughs> it's an erotic love song in the middle of your Bible. It is an extraordinary book of the Bible. It doesn't mention God. It doesn't mention anything religious. It's just the story of a young man's love for a girl. And it goes on and on in the same way that I've read to you. It's one of only two books in the whole Bible that never talk about God. And that we shall find is quite significant. It's a very sensual book. It appeals to all your senses, your smell, your taste, your touch. It's all here in this book. It's a collection of mildly erotic love songs. Quite extraordinary. You'd think it would have an X certificate or some indication in the Bible that it's not for children. It's certainly not actually. And then there are those who say this is one of the most spiritual books in the whole Bible. And they say it's written in a secret code and that everything means something else. For years I didn't dare to talk about this book in the Bible. I couldn't handle it. I got commentary after commentary and found that they all said a different meaning to all these things mentioned. I think I really touched rock bottom when I read in a commentary that where the girl says, my lover is resting between my breasts, that that actually means between the Old and the New Testament. And I thought, help! I'm a carnal man. When I read that verse, I don't see the Old and the New Testament. <laughs> and I thought, this is rubbish, isn't it? That all the plants and animals in this little book mean something else. But I couldn't seem to find the code. Some say it's a good test of your spirituality. 
because what you see in this book, they say, is not what you should see. And I had this real problem. The problem is that we read the Bible with Western eyes. And Western thinking was based on Greek thinking, not Hebrew. And this is a Hebrew book. In Greek thinking, spiritual and physical are widely separated. And you can't really be both. You're either a physical person or a spiritual person. That's the very opposite of Hebrew, where they think of one God and one world which he has made, and that the physical is as important as the spiritual, and they belong together. They're part of the same world in which we live. So I had to learn to get rid of this Greek idea and get back to the Hebrew thinking before I could even begin to understand this book. It is an affirmation of the sensual. It's telling you that physical love is good. That sex is not spelt S-I-N, but it's a good thing which God created to be used according to his principles. One of which, and the main one of which is that sex is to be enjoyed by a, a young man and a young woman after they are married and will be part of the cement that draws and keeps them together. Of course, if you try to have a lot of sex before you're married, you will then find yourself thinking of the wrong person when you're making love. Your memory will go back. The first occasion on which you enjoy sex will stay in your memory forever. What a tragedy to come into your marriage with that in your memory, so that when you make love to your wife, you're thinking of someone else. And many husbands have done that. You can spoil your marriage before you get into it by playing around. But these are two people who were going to get married, and they loved each other. But it's not just an affirmation of sensual and physical love. It's an analogy of another kind of love. That means it's like another kind of love. Do you know the Jewish rabbis, when they read this book, take their shoes off? They say they're in a holy place. And this book is one of the holiest books in the Bible to them. How did they get there? Let me underline this word analogy. That means that this is like that. And I want to contrast with it the word allegory, which looks at hidden meanings and looks at every detail to find its hidden meaning, to decode the message. This is not an allegory and was never meant to be an allegory, but it is an analogy. Human love is an analogy for divine love. And it means that you can use language that you would use when you were courting about your relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? One of the most famous verses I read to you was this, my beloved is mine and I am his. And when you can apply that to the Lord, you've found the secret of Christianity. So we're going to look at this book in quite a different way to the one that many preachers look at it. The first thing to say is that it really happened. It's not based on a fairy tale. It actually happened. And it is a real life love story. But you have to piece it together. I'm very fond of jigsaws which is one of the favorite hobbies in Israel for the Jews. They love jigsaws, and I do too, but I'm afraid I cheat. There's a picture on the lid of a jigsaw box, and when you first open it, there are all sorts of pieces of different color, and I can't put them together without the picture on the lid. 
and so I take a piece and move it around the picture until I find where it should be and then put it down so I can get through the most difficult jigsaw in about three hours. But that's because I've got the picture on the lid. Without that, I'm <coughs> sure I'd be still doing one, never finishing it. And the Song of Songs is very much a jigsaw. It's full of bits of their love story. And the problem is, how do you put them all together? Solomon wrote three books all together, which are all in your Bible. And he wrote them when he was different ages. And you can tell what age he was when you read them. When you read this song, he's a love, a young man. And he's so in love with a girl, he has no time for God. This is not unknown. When you fall in love the first time, this fills your whole thinking and your planning and you're overwhelmed by it. And he certainly was. In the Song of Solomon, there is not a word about God until you get to the very end. And that's because human love can crowd out your love for God. So when he wrote this song, he was a young man. When he wrote the book of Proverbs, you can tell how old he was. He said, now my son, beware of the women. Be very careful about women, they can be your undoing. And he goes on warning after warning. How old is he now? He's middle-aged. And like all middle-aged people, he's trying to stop the young people doing what he did. And I was once in a home where a young girl in her teens said to her mother, what did you do at my age that makes you so worried about me? <laughs> that, that's a deadly question. And it's a very honest one. When you turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, how old is Solomon? Well, here's what he says in that book. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the legs shake and before the eyes grow dim and the teeth are few. Remember your creator when you're young. How old is he now? He's an old man. And he's trying to tell young people, don't do what I did and forget your creator when you're young because you've fallen in love with someone. It's easy to do, and it can so easily happen. Now, most Hebrew poetry is based on real life, and this is too. But we have a problem. There are apparently three people in this song, three characters in the plot, three players in the drama. One, one is a rural shepherd boy, Another is the king, and the third is a young girl. And many preachers make a lot of that because it makes a jolly good evangelistic sermon. And they appeal to young people, are you going to belong to the good shepherd or the ruler of this world, the devil? You are like that girl torn between two loves and can't decide which way to go. But I want to tell you that's a misinterpretation. It's one that you will hear because it makes a rattling good sermon. But I want to tell you there are only two people in the plot. One is the young girl, and the other is both a king and a shepherd boy. That's not unknown. Our royal family are the same. They have country estates where they can go and just be themselves and be rural inhabitants instead of urban rulers. David was both a shepherd and a king. And that's combining the highest society with the lowest. So this is a story of two people, one of whom is a king, and when he's tired of king, becomes a shepherd. 
and the other is this girl. Now let me try and put the story together so that you begin to understand it. Here's the girl. It's a Cinderella story. It's the sound of music story. It's the same old story of rags to riches. And here is the girl. She lives on a farm which are tenants of the king of Israel. The king of Israel lives in Jerusalem, but he has this estate at the foot of Mount Hermon, that snow-capped mountain in the north of Israel. And he has many farms which are let out to tenant families. And this girl is brought up in one of those families. Her parents have died, but she still has some brothers who are very cruel to her. They make her go out into the fields every day to look after their vineyards. And they make her life a misery. She's a real Cinderella. And the result of that is that she will stand less and less chance of getting married. Because in those days and in that place, wives had to be pale, as white as possible. And the more time she spends out of doors doing her brother's work for them in the vineyards, the darker she gets in the sun. We read that. And therefore, the less chance she would have of getting married. To this day in the Middle East, a girl can be kept indoors for 12 months before her wedding so that she doesn't get darkened by the sun and is a pale bride. And so here she is working for her brothers all day and every day, tired out, and she's getting sunburned, darker and darker, and her hope of getting married to anyone is getting slimmer all the time. That's the story. One day, she's out in the fields and she sees a young man leading some sheep and goats through the fields. She has no idea who it is. We know it's the king of Israel taking some time off. And he's gone to one of his farms near Mount Hermon and He's looking out to sheep and goats. And she doesn't recognize who it is. But one thing she does do is fall for him. They fall deeply in love. And she doesn't know where he's from. She says, which farm are you from? Where do you go at the end of the day with the sheep and the goats? Where, where are you from? Oh, he says, if you want to know, you'll just have to follow the sheep someday. And he doesn't tell her who he is. And they fall deeper and deeper in love. And some of the poems are the sort of silly thing you write when you're in love with someone. When we moved house, we found packets of letters which I had written to her and she'd written to me when we were courting. And I undid one of the bundles and read them. I was shocked that a man of average intelligence could write that sort of stuff. I mean, it was dreadful. But you find that here in the poems here. For example, they talk about their bed being green. They're lying together in the long grass. And this is our bed, lovely. And he says, the ceiling are cedars or fir trees. Now you can tell they're not married because you talk like that before you're married. <laughs> After they're married, they say, I want a fitted kitchen and I want a decent bedroom. <laughs> but before they're married, our bed is green and the roof, <laughs> the roof is made of trees. It's pure sentiment, I know it's much, <laughs> but there it is and we've all done it. And my letters to my wife and hers to me before we're married are just like the Song of Songs. They say such silly things when you're in love. Well, this goes on for some time and she can't wait to get out into the fields each day 
to hope that this young man will come past with the sheep and the goats. And finally comes a great day when he proposes marriage to her. And she'd never thought she'd be married to anyone. And now her dreams have come true. And she's found her man. And, and she's going to be married. Get away from her cruel brothers. And live with the man she loves. And still she doesn't know who he is. That's the plot of the whole thing which makes it so exciting. But he now says, I'm afraid I'm going to leave you. I have work to do in this city and I'm going back there. He doesn't tell her the city is Jerusalem or that he's the king. He just says, I've got to go back to Jerusalem where I work and I will come back for you and marry you. And off he goes. And for months she doesn't hear of him. And now she begins to have bad dreams. She begins to think it's just been a holiday romance. And that he won't come back for her. And it comes out in her dreams. There are about five dreams in the book. I'll just mention one or two of them. One dream is that she's wandering through the streets asking everybody, where's my lover? Where's he gone? And the watchman of the, the night watchman she meets, have you seen my lover? And she's searching for him. And in that dream, she did find him. And she dreamt that she brought him back to her mother's bedroom where she was conceived. A very romantic thought there. Another dream she had was that she's lying on her bed and the lover is at the door and he's trying to unlock the door from the outside and it's bolted from the inside and he can't get in. And she finds, have you ever felt yourself in a dream where you can't move, where you're paralyzed? And she feels paralyzed on the bed and he's trying to get in and she wants to get up and open the door and let him in, but then finally she can move. And she runs to the door in the dream and she opens the door and there's no one outside. He's gone. Now it doesn't take a psychiatrist to analyze those dreams. They're of frustrated love. A love that is afraid of being disappointed. She's afraid that she's going to lose that lovely young man she met out in the fields. And it's preying on her mind. And time and again she dreams of trying to find him and can't find him. It's a well-known kind of dream. And then one day she's out in the fields and there's a cloud of dust on the road from the south. And she wonders what it was. And as, as the dust gets nearer, she can see soldiers on horses and a big carriage. And her brothers are with her at this time and she says, what's happening? Who, who is this coming? And he says, that's the king coming. The landlord of all these farms, he's coming. The king, get ready to bow down. When the carriage comes past, you bow low. And so when the carriage comes past, she and her brothers bow low. But as she lifts her head, she sees the young man in the carriage, and it's the king. And with horror, she realizes that he's come back to marry her. And that from now on, her life is going to be totally changed. She will now be the queen of Israel. More than that, I'm afraid the king has a reputation for queens. He's already got 60, according to this book. And she will be Queen 61. And I was told when I was a boy that King Solomon was the wisest man in the Old Testament. Well, he was for other people. But he didn't apply his wisdom to himself. And he finished up 
with 700 mothers-in-law. <laughs> would, would, would you say that was wise? <laughs> and he finished up with 300 mistresses on top of 700 wives. It's no wonder that he lost all his respect for women. He says that in Ecclesiastes. He says, I've only met one man in a thousand that I can respect, but I haven't met one woman I can respect. Now, why should he say such a dreadful thing? I have preached on that text. The feminists were a bit shocked. But he had lost all respect for women by having too many of them. He'd played around with too many. This lovely girl was the girl that God intended him to have, but he'd already had 60. He'd already been well on in his career before he met the girl. Tragedy of tragedies. If you play around with too many before you meet the right one, it's going to affect your marriage badly. And it certainly affected his badly because he went on to have another, how many? Another 540, 539, or whatever it was. No, I'm no good at maths. Well, now, that's the story, and now she finds herself queen in a palace in Jerusalem. The little girl who was pushed around by her brothers to do their work for them is now queen, but there are already 60 others. And this produces a huge inferiority complex in her because she compares herself with all the others. And she says, I'm dark from the sun, and they're all so beautifully fair. She says, I'm a lily of the valley. I'm a rose of Sharon. Those are not beautiful flowers. We think they are. We think a lily of the valley is really something, and a rose of Sharon must be really beautiful. And so many girls call themselves by the name of Sharon. But she is saying, I'm just a lily of the valley, a rose of Sharon. And in Israel, those are both little weeds that you walk on if you're not careful. And that's why the king comes back when she says, I'm just a little lily of the valley that people walk over. He says, no, you're not. You're a full-grown white lily, which is the most beautiful flower in Israel. And he argues with her. And she's constantly comparing herself with the other queens. And you find throughout the song she's longing to get back to the country and take the king with her. Why can't we just be a couple in love? Why do we have to be royal? Why do we have to be on a throne in this marvelous hall, this banqueting hall? She said, I just don't feel at home. I just want you as we were in the field. We were deeply in love. And he has to say, I'm sorry, but you're the queen now. You're expected to behave as a queen. And if you go through the song carefully, you'll find that the story I've told you is the story behind the song. And it has an amazing message for us today. The first message is that when you came to Christ and fell in love with Christ and thought it was going to be one long courtship in the fields, you have actually married a king. You're now royal family, and that's going to make a huge difference to your daily living. You now have something to live up to. You get the message? So the first message of the Song of Solomon is that unless you are in a love relationship with Jesus, you're not a Christian. That's the essence of being a Christian, to be in love with Jesus. And you love him because you found his forgiveness. He said, 
people who've been forgiven much love much. The two are related. And once Christ has forgiven you, you love him. And that is your relationship with him. It's a very personal relationship. And he has to have your love to be one of his. I think of Simon Peter. After the resurrection, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. I'm bored stiff waiting for Jesus to come and appear. And they went back to Galilee and they went out fishing and they caught nothing all night. I've been a fisherman on Galilee. I've been out with them. And they have a big net which you throw out in a circle and it drops and hopefully gets three or four fish. Nowadays, they have a, an oil lamp over the stern of the boat as an artificial moon which attracts the fish up. And uh, I spent a whole night with fishermen on Galilee. I'll never forget it. So here's Peter and the others in a boat, disappointed after an all-night fishing that's caught nothing. And as they begin to pack up their nets, there's a man standing on the shore, and he shouts, you're doing it all wrong. Now let me give you a word of advice. Saying that to a fisherman is not the most tactful thing you can do. Especially a man who's been fishing for a long time and caught nothing. Don't try and tell him how he should be fishing. But this stranger on the shore told them, if you threw your net over the opposite side of the boat, you'd catch some, which they did. And they caught 148 fishers in one throw. That is extraordinary. A 10 or a dozen might be a really good catch, but 148. Now, don't get it wrong. You'd be amazed how often preachers have tried to give the meaning of the word 148. I'll tell you actually what 148 means. It means that's a lot of fish. <laughs> and that's all it means. Don't look for hidden meanings in the Bible. Take the Bible at face value. And Peter said, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. He's met us in Galilee. And uh, I forget which one of them flung themselves into the water and waded ashore. And the others came with the boat pulling the net full of fish. And then Peter went through the most humbling experience of his life. He had stood in the courtyard when Jesus was arrested and they marched Jesus right past him. And a little girl said to Peter, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? I never knew the man, but you speak with a Galilean accent. I know, but plenty of other people do. I don't know him. And three times she said to him, you're one of his. And three times he swore that he was, was not. And he remembered that. And after that, he just went out and wept his soul out. And now, after the resurrection, they are facing the same thing he faced in the courtyard. It says he was warming his hands at a charcoal fire. And there are only two charcoal fires mentioned in your New Testament. One is where Peter denied the Lord three times, but the other is now. The risen Jesus has lit a fire and cooked breakfast for them. A charcoal fire, it says. And that must have immediately taken Peter's mind back. And then Jesus spoke to him three times three times and he said Peter do you love me and Peter was so ashamed that he wouldn't use the word love he said you know I like you 
And he said a second time, Peter, do you love me? And the second time, Peter said, you know. He said, do you love me more than these, than the others? He said, you know I like you so much. So the third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you just like me? And Peter had to say, you know everything, Lord, you know I do. But he wouldn't use the word love. Very interesting. And the third time, Jesus came down to his level, started where he was, and he said, you just like me? And Peter said, you know I do. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You're fishing, but I'm going to make you a shepherd. I will make you the first pastor of my church, which is what he did. It's a wonderful story, it, and it's true, and it's because Jesus is saying, I can cope with your weaknesses, provided I know you love me. You may deny me, but if you love me, I can cope with you. And that's what Peter is saying to everybody in this room now. Whatever your weaknesses, whatever ways in which you let me down, and you will, if I know that I have your love, I've got what I want. I can teach you, I can chastise you, I can mature you, I can grow you if I know that you love me. My wife has said the same to me. She said, David, you're full of faults. She knows them better than anyone else. And uh, she's very tactful that she doesn't talk about them to anyone else because she knows I love her. And as long as she, she's sure of that, she's put up with me for 55 years. And that's a miracle of grace. But she's done it because she knows that I love her. And however I let her down, she's sure that she has my heart. That's the heart of the message of this song to you. That's at the heart of the Christian life. And if Jesus knows you love him, he can cope. And he will complete what he's begun in you. That's the truth. But now comes the other side of the message of this amazing story, this amazing song. And the other side of it is that you are now a public figure. It's not just between you and Jesus. It's between you in front of a whole lost world. And they will watch you. And they will criticize you. And it's amazing how your enemies really are your friends when they point out to you a Christian shouldn't do that, a Christian shouldn't be like this. They're your friends if they point that out because it'll help you to live like a queen. It'll help you to be a royal person. You should walk with dignity in this world. You belong to the royal family of Singapore. That's a great honor and responsibility. I thought I had some photographs to show you. Are they in my case? You'll know what they're about. Yes, let me have them. Because this is something that I'm quite sure you all watched recently. They're cuttings from our local paper. Wonder if you recognize this person. Do you recognize her? Did you not watch the royal wedding? <laughs> That's Kate Middleton. She was a very ordinary schoolgirl. <laughs> Then she went to college and she met a boy called William and she fell in love with him. And he was a Prince William. So she is now Princess Kate. And my, that royal wedding was something. Look at this. 
<laughs> and just as in the Song of Solomon, she said, let him kiss me with kisses of love. There they are on the balcony of Buckingham Palace doing exactly the same thing. And so she must now learn to be what she was not. She must learn to be very public. She must learn to be the, in front of the crowds and walk with dignity. He fell in love with her when they first met because she was wearing a transparent dress. <laughs> and uh, there were photographs in the press of him and that dress. She wouldn't wear it now. She dare not because she's now a royal princess. That's what's happened to you. And the way you conduct yourself in this world is going to reflect on the king. You are his bride. And though you might revel in your private personal relationship with, with him, and many of the choruses we sing were really written for private love sessions with Jesus. They are I, me choruses and they're choruses about I love you Jesus but we need more we choruses for corporate worship uh, and that's quite different so we don't use private love songs for Jesus in public worship when we come together we want to say we love you but you are called where even if you're the only Christian in your office or place of work you are royal family. I was once counseling a delightful young man, but he'd been born with a twisted body. Every one of his brothers and sisters had big, strong bodies, but he had a, a little, weak, twisted body. His name was Philip, and uh, he came to me really unhappy. He said, they bullied him at school, and they were now bullying him at work and teasing him because he was not big and strong like others. I said, what's your name? He said, Philip. I said, Philip, I want you be to begin every day by looking in the mirror and saying, good morning, Prince Philip. Now, Prince Philip is the name of the husband of our Queen Elizabeth. And I wanted him to realize that as a Christian, and he was, he was royal family and should conduct himself with dignity. And he looked at me and he said, how did, how did you know? I said, how did I know what? He said, do you know how they tease me at work? They call me Prince Philip. <laughs> and they're bullying me by saying that. And I said, but it's the truth. You are a prince in the royal family. And so when they say, good morning, Prince Philip, acknowledge that as the prince would. <laughs> it may sound silly advice, but it worked with him. And he's now walking through this world with dignity, with seriousness, as befits a royal male. I'm going to close with that because I just wanted to say those two things to you. One, be sure that a personal love for Jesus is at the heart of your walk with God. And two, lift your heads and walk through this world with the dignity of a royal family. <laughs> because one day when he gets back, you are going to rule the world with him. Live that way and live the way he wants you to live. Even though you long for those lovely personal moments when you were just in love together, you are called for a very public life and you need to live that way. Amen.